Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sorry, it's 11. We got folks joining us online, and we greet you, and uh, we greet everyone here in the room. Um, and we're thankful for everyone um, who's able to attend here with us either way. Uh, we had our first junior camp uh, last, uh, this last week, and um, it went well. We didn't have a, a lot of kids overall, and it was kind of like Young Life Camp. What was interesting about that was that we ended up being one of the largest groups there. We had uh, six kids, five, six kids? Five kids. Five yeah. kids. And um, we, had a, we had kids in every group, um, which was pretty cool. Uh, when we go to Young Life Camp, sometimes they say, we have a group here that has 32% of their high school here, and it's McKenzie, and we're like, yeah, that's 15 kids. <laughs> that's 32% of our tiny high school. Um, but it was, it was kind of an encouragement to see um, that we, we had such a good showing from our group. And um, this week, we, they haven't shut us down. So we're going to go into junior camp two. It's going to be exactly the same format. And um, we have decided to call off junior camp three. And uh, we are still hopeful um, for our Young Life, uh, Young Life camps that will be at Grove, which will be the last week of July, the 23rd to, uh, 20th through the 23rd, and then the first week of August, which is the 4th through the 6th. Is it a lack of funds or a lack of, of sign-ups that, that makes all of that? Well, it's a lack of funds. Well, it's a lack of funds. Well, it's a it's a little bit of both, um, and because we haven't gone as we we had three because we thought we were going to get a ton of people. Um, so I think that possibly is that we're losing money. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, so I but I I didn't necessarily fight them because it's it's been doing the day camps and driving back and forth has been kind of wearing was where one week of it was pretty tiring. Um, so. It's I when the camp manager said we're calling off week three. I said, all right, it's kind of his call. Um, in terms of other special announcements, um, I won't be here this Friday again because of camp. Um, but Ed is going to go ahead and lead Bible study here at the church. That's going to be at 10 o'clock on Friday. Um, it'll be in Acts chapter 12. It'll um, so anyone who can join us then, that would be great. Um, other than that, uh, we've been having people donate goods towards a yard sale. And the yard sale is actually something that we could do. Um, but it's something we'll need to discuss as a church, um, how we'd like to do that. Beyond, beyond setup, where we, we could just keep our distance from each other, um, we could just then have a couple people um, take shifts and wear a mask, but it is something we could do. Um, it's one of these things that people really look forward to in the area that we do. It's and uh, we we could do it. We could put the we could put the arrows of where people should walk, and they'll ignore them and go the way they want to go. And and uh, mm -hmm. but we could we could definitely set it up. And it's outdoors, so it is actually very it's quite safe um, because of the ventilation. Yeah. But it's something we should discuss. Um, and we may, it may be something we want to move on sooner rather than later um, because we just don't know how much longer uh, as, as things kind of climb. It was remarkable to me because uh, I was, when we had our initial shutdown, we were heading towards man camp. And um, I remember being in the store buying supplies for man camp when they, they shut everything down. And uh, we are, we're in a much worse position now <laughs> Um, than we were then. So it's one of these things where I don't know how long 
um, things will be remain open for us. Our state is doing a lot better though than many other states. Um, the only thing that concerns me is that we're not doing very well on testing. So we're just gonna have to play it by ear. But the, um, the yard sale is something we could do if we'd like to, um, or we could just find, figure out a way to store the goods until next summer, whatever we wanna do. Or maybe it'll be something we do in the fall if we have a nice, good, dry, late fall. I think that's it for announcements. This morning we're, we're in um, Acts chapter 11 where we have the first time we are called Christians. And um, what ends up happening is that the church in Jerusalem hears that things are going so well there in Antioch that they send Barnabas to go and kind of lead the charge. And, and Barnabas gives us this... Uh, these kind of instructions. So this is verse 23. When he arrived and saw the evidence of grace, of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. So right there in verse 23, the biggest thing that he could get across to them, which is true for us, especially during these trying, difficult times, uh, I know that things are very uncertain for a lot of people. Barnabas gave them this encouragement. Remain true to the Lord with all your heart. I think the more we focus on that, the easier it is. I know that um, everything when it, it comes to our lives right now has become harder, and that has become true of our spiritual lives as well. Um, I noticed at camp this week, usually worshiping is something that came very easily when I was at camp, but this week I found I had to push myself to stop everything I was doing and join the kids in worship. And even my quiet time in the morning with us having to drive an hour to get to camp, I had to wake up earlier to have my time with the Lord. But the more we do it, the more that we remain true to the Lord with all our hearts, I believe the better off we will be to manage and navigate the, these difficult times. Let us start this service with prayer. Lord, there's so much uncertainty right now. Um, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's anger, there, there's malice. And Lord, we are uh, trying to uphold this name uh, that started in Antioch, the name that is Christians. I pray that we would have our hearts remain truly on you as, uh, so that the name Christian would have a positive context. I, I pray especially that during these uh tumultuous times that we could possibly maybe even change our negative name with people around us. But this morning, Lord, we pray that this encouragement would be the focus of our hearts as we come to you in worship. I pray that our hearts would just remain on you during this time we have set aside to worship you, and that we would just focus on you this morning, knowing that you are God. And for some folks, um, maybe they're in the room and maybe they're not. That's a lot harder these days but I pray that we would try our best so that we would maintain a connection with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Overused words. <laughs> I am not sure why that was there. <laughs>
Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy to walk on to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And there will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth and told. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven or your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged thinking of the wall. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amen. One of our greatest blessings is um, the gift that our Heavenly Father has given us in the Holy Spirit. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the leaf to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It's free up within my soul. It's free up and make me close, free up and get to me.
you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore
worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, He draws near, and my time has come. Still, my soul sing Your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever. Father, we, we just thank you for all of the many, many blessings that you pour out on our lives. And we just want to worship you and give you thanks with every breath that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And um, Sean was going to be giving the communion meditation. But I imagine Brett can help us out. One of the things that struck me uh, this week as I was working through Acts 11 with this first church of Gentiles was how much everything had to look different. To introduce Christianity to Gentiles who were purely Greek, everything probably looked a little bit different. One of the things I had to wrestle with was how would communion look for a Greek family? What type of bread would they use? What type of wine would they use? At the end of the day, though, the meaning is what comes out the most. When Paul talks to, uh, talks to believers about how they should practice communion, he focuses on the heart of the matter, much like Barnabas in his invocation to the church there in Antioch says that it has to start with this inward process. In uh, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, verses 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, and is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Think about around the world how many people practice communion and how many different ways the staple bread and the staple drink may be interpreted. The biggest thing, though, that we are supposed to actually focus on is the remembrance. The remembrance of how much Jesus loved us. As I talked to kids um, here this week, one of the things I, I talked about with them as they came to my station was how much if God created the world and God created them, that he created them perfectly the way they were. I also talked to them about the uncomfortableness that Jesus must have faced as he came here as God to earth. 
but how much he did it out of love for us. These are concepts that I think no matter what group of people you interact with, no matter where they are, even this morning we have people who are here in the room that will have the uncomfortable um, pre-sealed cups. And then we have people who are at home who do not have what we have. But if we focus our hearts on the right things this morning, that is what God deems as the most important. Let us pray for the communion this morning. Lord, I just want to thank you for all that you uh, do for us. And this morning, as we come in a time where things are different, the bread and cup we are using this morning is different. The way we are gathering is different. You have asked us to look past all of that and use times in our lives. In fact, you almost make it sound like every time we eat and every time we drink, that we would just remember the grace that you gave to us on the cross. The love that you showed by laying down your life for us so that we would be called your children. I pray that this morning we would let go of all the exterior and focus our heart on what is most important, which is that you loved us, that you created all things, you created us in your image, and you made no mistakes with us, no matter how different we are around this world as we gather together. But that as long as we love you, then our hearts are in the right place. I pray for everyone that, that being with you has become harder. I pray that we would use this time to build our endurance, that we would come to love you in a new way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
want to encourage you all to um, uh, raise your hand if you have any prayer requests or any praises this morning. Anne? Thank you. Uh, they're going to replace my battery. Yay. At Two Rivers Surgical Center. So there won't be any interference with the treatment of the COVID-19 patients. Mm -hmm. And it will be done before September the 17th. All right. I want to thank you all for praying for it. Thank you. <laughs> thank God. Greg. I want to pray for all the government leaders that they have the strength in spite of the criticism to act in their faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's um, especially important to pray for our leaders right now during this difficult time and for their faith. Yeah. Um, I think I saw Jackie's hand go up first. All right, we'll keep the, the people of East China and Japan in our prayers as they go through uh, flooding. Uh, it sounds like, is that, or just the rainstorms? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Cindy? Um, my neighbor's curious on if we did the same. Uh, I know six months are really rough. Okay. Can you send us an email? Good. Good. I'm glad to hear James is doing well, and we'll we'll lift Curtis up in prayer. Thank you, Cindy. And Donna. Um, I'm getting a CPAP. Uh, my bones. So my commissioner said I'm always tired, um, and I have to do it. So, so it's nice to finally know that in 30 days I might have something. Else. Wonderful. Yeah, good. All right. Well, praise God for that. Yeah. Um, Brent's dad is not feeling well today. He had uh, his pulse was really, really high. So let's, let's keep Steve Colley in our prayers. And I'm thankful that uh, my mom was able to um, come home from the hospital and she's been feeling better. Yeah. And um, I, on a kind of a personal matter, I am afraid I offended somebody and I would like prayer for um, being able to fix that. It's kind of an unusual prayer request, but these things happen. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we just want to rejoice with Anne as she looks forward to getting uh, the battery replaced that relieves her back pain and um, just... We thank you and we pray that all goes well with that. Uh, we want to lift up our leaders, um, really the leaders all around the world. Um, but we just ask that you would help them to stand firm in the faith, that they will um, be on guard for attacks from, from Satan that they will be courageous and strong and that they will be, um, be acting in love and care. And Lord, we want to lift up the people of East China and Japan that are getting so hit so hard with the rainstorms. We ask for mercy, Lord, that you would, you would let up uh, the rain in that area. 
Father, we want to lift up Curtis and just pray that you will give him courage, comfort, peace, that you will help him uh, through this difficult time and, and um, let him know how much he's loved and cared for. Father, we, we uh, rejoice with Donna as she um, sees a solution to being tired and uh, this CPAP machine. And we, um, we just thank you and we pray that that does the job. Father, we don't know what's wrong with, with Steve, um, Brent's dad, and we just ask, Lord, that you would help to find a solution so that he's not um, feeling so horrible. And Father, we thank you that my mom is um, doing better, but we also ask for a solution and answers to what is wrong. And Lord, um, I suppose I could pray for probably more than just me. Where there's offense, I just ask that you will bring understanding and and respect and and love and to help help us please give us wisdom uh, to be able to make peace and father we want to lift up brent as he brings your word this morning in jesus name we pray amen Good morning, welcome, and I want to thank everybody. Did you guys see me catch that 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 pan? I, I remember when I first started here. I think I was serving communion one of the first times, and I dropped a tray, and it made the most loud, awful, non-meditative sound you could <laughs> you could think of. So, it was, but it brought to mind uh, the the uh, a word that has been shared a lot. I don't need this anymore. I'm not so comfortable to wearing them because I've had them at camp. I don't need it right now, though. Um, the word that's been going around during this whole thing is the word nimble. Everyone needs to be nimble during this epidemic to kind of roll with the punches and, and move quickly. Uh, it doesn't only mean to be flexible, but to think on your feet and, and kind of move with stuff. And that's definitely what this last week has looked like um, for me. And I think that for the early church, it was what they had to learn to do. Um, it was a, a sort of a constant process of learning what really mattered um, when you got down to it and what stuff was exterior that sometimes we focused on too much. And, and in the book of Acts and chapter 11, we have um, basically the disciples, the name disciple grows to the new name that we know ourselves as now which is Christians. The church in Antioch is the first group that's called the name Christians. Um, up here, I kind of have this uh, biblical acrostic um, where it has disciples and Christians at sort of a crossroads. Because up to this point, they were known as disciples. And from, beyond, from this point on and to today, uh, who here gets called a disciple as much as a Christian? I think it's, it's interesting because at the, at the core of it, we're supposed to continue to be disciples, which means we're students with the ability to be taught. But the name Christian came as a collective name. If you're a disciple, you are a student. If anything, a group name hopefully will then convey still the idea that you are a group of students who are willing to be nimble and learn on your feet. The first half of Acts 11, I won't really get into. It's when uh, the church in Jerusalem finds out that Peter has uh, went to the centurion's house and converted the household, and they weren't very happy about it. And he then tells them, uh, he sort of gives them the account of what happens. And what's so remarkable is um, at the end of it, um, we have this reaction in verse 18. When they heard this, they had no further objections. Praise God, saying, so then God has granted even Gentiles repentance 
unto life. Um, I, in our Sunday school this morning, I, I talked about it a little bit, but to me, as someone in ministry, verse 18 is quite the miracle when it comes to ministry life. That when you can give an explanation and everyone in the room says, great, we'll move on. This was the type of thinking that they had to have during this time. I think that as we are going through this pandemic, as well as racial unrest, social unrest, and now even financial woes, one of the things that we're going to have to do is be a little bit more like the church in Jerusalem, that when the word comes that something is good and is moving the, uh, the presence of God forward, that we jump on board right quick and say, so then God has granted this. But this morning, we're mainly going to be tar- talking about the church in Antioch. It is a char- church that becomes very strong and very powerful very quickly. And it comes to the aid of the early church on numerous occasions within the Bible and then within Christian um, sort of legend. The church in Antioch remains strong for a very long time, but how it begins is pretty exciting. But I thought um, before we got there, we have these words sometimes in our lives, overused words. Um, one I hear a lot is at school is literally. I hear kids say literally, and I often ask them, do you know what literally means? Um, Because you're using it very metaphorically. Um, But the word literally is a word that gets overused. Always is a word that gets overused. And right next to always is the word never. Um, I, whenever I do any kind of parental counseling or marital counseling, I instruct them to avoid the words always and never as they describe things that are bothering them because very rarely is something always happening or something's never happening. Usually there are very case by case things going on, but you'll hear these words always, never, epic. I don't know how current that one was, but I remember hearing it a lot when I first started youth ministry, the word epic, everything was epic. I think they have new words now, lit, there you go. Um, Which isn't the most positive context, but, uh, and a word that also gets overused sometimes is the word Christian. Um, especially, I, I hear folks who will talk about Christians. And a, a good question for us to think about and ponder and reflect upon is the first time you were called a Christian. Was it some, when someone else called you a Christian, not yourself, was it a positive context or was it a negative context that you were called a Christian? Because that's the world we live in, and sometimes that's by our own doing, and sometimes that's by no choice of our own. When I was growing up in Africa as a kid, I remember being hoarded by children, and one of the things they would ask me for, and I don't know where this came from, but they believed we had to have a large surplus of bubble gum. And they would say, bubble gum, bubble gum, bubble gum, and we'd say, we don't have any gum. And they would say, but you're a Christian you're supposed to give us gum. And I remember as a kid, not understanding the Bible fully at all, wondering where did this notion that Christian equals bubble gum come from? And who do I have to go and kick in the shins for starting this? Because for years, places we went to, we were hoarded by kids requesting bubble gum. But at some point, probably Christian ministry uh, ministers before us or missionaries used as a ministry tool, bubble gum, and much like the people that followed Jesus around after the feeding of the 5,000, they wanted gum or food and not what was really being offered. But more importantly, I remember that connotation of the idea that if you were a Christian, you must give me whatever I request. And what's hard about that, that idea is that Jesus tells us that we should be prepared to give And if somebody asks us for a shirt, we should give our coat. And then the balance, though, of enablement sometimes. It was something that kind of plagued me as a Christian all the way into my adult years until I really dug in deep to find where where do we find the line of giving? Because that was something that meant a lot to me as a Christian. But for the rest of us, you may have a different story of where your name, Christian, came from. 
I know that throughout my life, it went started there. And in high school, the name Christian meant a stick in the mud. And in college, it meant a stick in the mud or judgmentalism or whatever it might be. I remember being in my women's sociology class as the token white Christian male. It was very exciting. They said, we need someone to talk about this. And I said, I'll be your token white Christian male for this scenario. It was never as mean as anyone would make those stereotypes out to be, but it was always an interesting conversation. All the way until adulthood, the word Christian means different things. At the school, especially during my after-school program, I will hear students talk about Christians, and I will often ask them, do you actually know a Christian in the way you're describing them? And they will say no. And I said, actually, you do. And I told them me and another teacher are, in fact, Christians. And I said, and we both challenge that stereotype you're trying to put on us. The church in Antioch will be the first group that has this title. And we don't even know if it's a good one or if it's a bad one. So what is a Christian? The question we should really ask ourselves is do we meet the Bible's definition of Christian versus the world's definition of Christian? Having a large surplus of bubble gum does not make you a Christian. Necessarily, even attending church doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. Do the people you align with that claim to be Christian, do they align with the Bible? I find it very interesting as I see people in leadership they will claim to be on the side of the Christians, but they will dodge questions about their own faith. They're aligned with us. They claim to be on our behalf. But when you ask them about tenets of the faith, they usually dodge those questions. And does the public have a good view of Christians? I've, I've come to know that this answer usually comes down to a couple of things. Do they currently know any Christians? Are they having an ongoing relationship with Christians? There are a lot of people out there who have been hurt by Christians. I, I'm never short to apologize when someone tells me the story of why they walked away from the faith, and it's usually Christians who have behaved badly. But the bigger question is, do they know Christians now who are changing that point of view for them or not? Because that's our charge as Christians. We should have a large people around us who can look at us and have a different idea of what this word Christian means. I know for me, what it, what that still is fighting off the connotation that I am a stick in the mud. I try to make it that I'm as fun as possible when I'm with a group of non-believers, even if I remain sober in their presence because I'm trying to change the idea that you cannot be a fun person who has a sense of humor and be a Christian at the same time. But there is still a line, and I try for the line to be the thing that turns it to unhealthy. I think that the more that Christians do this, the better the church is referenced. This is a sort of a common statement that I've ha I found online when people uh, are asked to what a Christian is, I think you could have a million different answers. The church is composed of Jesus Christ and his followers who have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and are committed to Christ's witness and mission. Now, this definition is by far not scriptural, but I think we could look at it and say, that's true. That's what it is. That's what the church should be. What's difficult is that there's so much play on this the rest of it doesn't really matter that much. When you're going to do missions of any kind, one of the things you have to regularly reconcile is that the church that you may be going and interacting with will look, sound, smell, and taste nothing like the church you grew up with. I remember telling the teens last summer as we were going to Lesotho that they should be really prepared for the church service because it was going to be five hours long. They thought I was exaggerating, and I said, no, it's going to be five hours long. And afterwards, they will expect you, without telling you, to go and serve them food. And you'll have to go in the kitchen, the food will be prepared, and all you have to do is help serve it up. 
we got to that church service and they were lost. I was completely at home because it was a church service that I grew up with. Nothing was done in the right order. Nothing was done like how our church does it. Communion was different. They even had times that I had never even heard of in the church of Lesotho. They had times where they let people just come up and share what the Lord was doing in their life. And it was a lot of time. I think we, I remember us spending about an hour and 20 minutes letting people come up and just share what the Lord was doing in their life. But at the same time, it was also very scriptural because that's one of the things the church should actually practice, not just having Brent up every time. And more importantly, the church in Antioch really fulfills what we have as the Great Commission. You will receive power from the Holy Spirit as it comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. What we have here right at the beginning is the final fulfillment of the Great Commission, where the gospel is going far outside of Israel, starting with the fringes and moving outwards. So this is Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The, Lord, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I tell you what, when you're doing ministry, it doesn't get much more exciting than that. You just show up, tell a group of people about the Lord, and they say, all right, I'm in. It doesn't happen that easily, usually. Sometimes it does. I think one of the really exciting things here is that in most accounts in the book of Acts, we have main characters who are fulfilling these roles. When it comes to the church in Antioch, there, were no, there was no Peter or John or Philip or even Paul that introduced Christ to the church in Antioch. It just says men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Regular Christians went and said, you know what? We've been talking to Jews, but I think today we'll talk to the Greeks as well. And from this, the ministry to the Gentiles really begins to explode. I think the exciting thing is that we could look at this and say, I don't need necessarily someone who is in leadership. I can go to that person or this person and tell them the good news. And it'll go from there. More importantly, it says in verse 21 is that the Lord's hand was with them. I think that we should be encouraged that in our interactions with people out there, God is working with us, before us, and even afterwards. God really wanted the church in Antioch to happen. I think that we can think about places where you think God would probably really like to move. And the answer is yes, I'm probably sure that God really wants to move in that area. And so when we go out and we share, we should know that the Lord is with us in that. So what is a Christian? A Christian is not what the world imposes on the name. Christians may look completely different than anything you grew up with as a standard. What happens is that the word of this gets back to the church in Jerusalem. And they decide, luckily they have already made a decision that reaching the Gentiles is good. But they now have to be nimble and think, what are we going to do? The church of the future is going to look nothing like this, most likely. Especially if we keep on having viruses. The church of the past looks nothing like the church we have now. There's things that we've created and latched on to Christianity that just aren't that important. They're important to us, but they're not exactly what Jesus wants us to focus on. One of the things that happened this week at camp was being in the rhythm of camp again was one of the best things that was part of my mental health for a very long time. Just being there with the teens that were helping at the camp in the evenings and having conversations with them, just being in the rhythm of worship, just being in the practice, 
of being in, in focus of spreading ministry, even though the camp was not at the right place, not on the right dates, not done the right way, and definitely in no way, shape, or form felt like the norm as we walked around with masks in the heat and had to separate all the groups from each other and put hand sanitizer in each, between each spot and spray everything down with Lysol. It's no fun washing one of, the, uh, one of those really bouncy balls. I had to wash a little bouncy ball between every game of Gaga Ball. And I thought, boy, this is not fun. But at the same time, it was one of the best things I could do for my mental health because finally I felt like we were moving in the right direction even though we were having to really work on our feet. Continuing on to verse 24. News of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with their, all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and great number of people were brought to the Lord. So one of the first things that the church in Jerusalem does is they send someone down. Now, there's a few ways you could read this. You could say that they're sending someone down to do quality control, and sometimes it does seem like that happens. One of the ways that I like to think about this is they sent Barnabas as, as an investment in that church. It sounded like Barnabas was a pretty crucial part of the church in Jerusalem, but they said, this sounds pretty exciting that the Lord is moving down there in Antioch. So we're going to send one of our best folks down there for a length of time to invest in that group. I think investing in where God is moving is one of the biggest things that churches have done in the right direction. Caring nothing about denomination or practice, but hearing that if the good news is being spread somewhere, to jump on board and say, I'm going to move in that direction. It's always exciting having missionaries come and talk about where and how the Lord is moving. Whenever we hear it, we get excited and say, man, that's something I would like to invest in. In the same way, God wants us, if we hear of something within our community as working, he says, jump on board. One of the things that I, I've heard of that uh, has gotten me very excited is how much um, our AA and our Celebrate Recovery have done upriver. This means that this is something that God is moving in. And it becomes so much easier to try and incorporate that and invest in it than when you know that it's working. Continuing from verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians at Antioch. Not only does Barnabas get invested, Barnabas, for whatever reason, says, you know who's perfect for this job? It's Saul. We talked about this in our Sunday school this morning. What could have been the motivation? Could it be that he felt like this would be a good way for Saul to get some more practice? Did he just, was he concerned that Saul would fall off the wagon if he was in one spot too long? Or was it that he knew that Saul knew the Old Testament from back to front as a Pharisee and was really good at teaching and Barnabas had already run to the end of his rope in that regard? Because all of us have our own strengths and weaknesses. Barnabas was a great encourager. Saul was a really good teacher. One thing we do know is that out of this, working together, Barnabas and Paul, or Saul, they become partners for a while, going from place to place to introduce uh, people to, the, to Christ. And this was the first place that they were called Christians. I think that this is exciting because for the longest time, the disciples believed that Christians would look like Jews and that Christians would just save Israel and that Christians would eventually take over the kingship as well as remove the Romans. But now Christians look like Greeks, talk like Greeks. 
eat the food that Greek people eat. In the same way, we should have the same heart to know that as we go and spread the word of God, the people we spread the word of God to will look completely different than us. I remember the memorial service of Glenn, Jody's husband. Uh, we had a large gathering of bikers here at the church. They were Christian bikers, part of a Christian bikers gang. If you want to call them a gang, it was a group of old guys on bikes. But I remember um, there was someone that had been attending our church and visiting, and he came by very concerned about what was going on. And he asked me how I could let folks who look like that into our church. And I said, it was real easy for me. I said, these are the folks that I think have been lost for many, many years, this age group. And I said, in fact, if you went inside and got to know them, you would actually find out that beneath the surface, they are Christians. If you would actually get to know them, you would know that they are actually trying to reach this whole group for the Lord. And I said, I can't be any more excited about the men that are in that room. I never saw that person again. They never came back to church. It was one of those interactions where I thought about it for months and months and months, wondering if I should have said things differently, maybe try to appease him. But at the end of the day, my heart had actually been moved by some of what I'd heard in the room from those men describing their faith and the faith of Glenn. They were Christians who wore black leather, had tattoos all over their body, and looked like they had all just gotten out of jail recently. But they were Christians. And they were on a similar purpose as me, as someone wearing a suit that day. And I think the thing that struck me the most was that one of them shared the Lord so well, I didn't feel like I had to preach much after that. I said, this guy knows how to preach to this audience. He knows this group. I am an outsider. But the thing I could do was I interacted with them openly. One of them, I remember, was so uncomfortable um, and, and was afraid that I would judge him for his belief. And it was an encouragement to him, just like Barnabas going after Saul, that I come after him and tell him I really loved what he shared and how awesome it was. He was someone that was serving the Lord who had just who apparently constantly faced judgment for the way he looked and how he dressed. But he, I could tell deep down, was a Christian. When you're in the practice of ministry long enough, you begin, no matter what type of ministry it is, you begin to figure out if people are following the core versus the exterior. Are they wearing a suit, but do they love the Lord? Are they saying things that go along with what my itching ears want to hear? Or are they saying things that are biblically true and maybe I didn't want to hear it? These are all things that we have to discern as Christians as we move forward. Continuing from verse 27. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit, predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. They did, uh, this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. What ends up happening is that first the church in Israel invests Barnabas into them, and Barnabas invests Saul. Mm -hmm. And the church continues to grow, and then they have this prediction of bad things coming to happen. They could have said, we're the church in Antioch. We're going to take care of ourselves. Make sure that during this famine, we're going to be okay. But their hearts first said, we're going to make sure that the other only established church we know of is also going to be okay. 
This is how the church grows and how Christians sometimes stand out the most. I think about all the natural disasters, especially that happen during the summer. Whenever they play out on the news, one of the things I always look for are the Christian groups in the background. They all have matching shirts sometimes, except that there's so many different groups with matching shirts, it's kind of a rainbow of shirts. But they're all Christian groups that show up at different places after tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, and help the people there rebuild. And the thing I always do is I always pray that the people there would see them as Christians in a new light, and anyone that watches the news would see the name Christians in a new light. Christians who are giving of themselves, living the gospel, handing out water and food and clothing and shelter, rebuilding homes, whatever it might be, that this is what it means to be a Christian. So what is a Christian? Someone who has been born again of the Holy Spirit by God's gracious gift. If you're on the mission field and someone tells you they are a Christian, Usually, you follow up with a question about this. Because there's no greater deflection from someone approaching you about the Lord than to say, oh, I'm a Christian. But as you do it, more and more, you find out that some folks consider themselves to be Christians via birth or via osmosis from their family. My family is Christian, therefore, I am Christian. And you have to ask them, did you make a decision to repent and be born again? If not, that title doesn't quite yet fit. Someone who has placed a saving faith in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of sins. These are all core tenets that Christians follow. And more importantly, Jesus warns us to sometimes test Folks who say that they believe in this. People who say that they are aligned with us, who are our advocates for us. If they do not believe in this, they're usually advocates for something that is more cultural or political than for what we are actually trying to do as Christians. Because our biggest goal should be more and more people saying they believe in Jesus as their salvation. Anything else is the outside of Christianity that doesn't really matter. It's the shell and not the heart. Someone who confesses Jesus is Lord. Someone who witnesses the good news of Jesus to others. Someone who is godly and follows the teachings of Christ. To say you are a Christian and to not live up to the last one is one of the biggest turnoffs to someone who is looking at our faith. I know because I work with numerous people from my age group down who will tell me stories of the Christian that disappointed them. Sometimes the stories are a little bit bogus, I'll admit. Sometimes they are completely and utterly justified in their anger towards that person because the person made a decision where they were not following the teachings of Christ and were usually following the teachings of man. But even within those circumstances, I'm able to ask them questions and talk to them about the fact that that person that they had put so much of their hope in was just a person and ask them if they have found the teachings of Christ to ring true. Because at the end of the day, the people that are on the outside usually say that they do believe in Jesus and do believe he is a good teacher and a good man. But the question has always has to be, are you willing then to follow him and his teachings, knowing that you will most likely also be a little flawed? And I forgive you ahead of time for it as long as you forgive me. At the same time, the church following all of these is how we stay the healthiest. This partnership between Saul and Paul eventually kind of runs its course, and they begin to have conflict. We will only continue to grow the more we practice these tenets. 
the last of which are someone who is actively connected to a local church. And I will say that this definition has definitely changed through this virus. In fact, when someone asked me about this topic, and there's a lot of articles right now saying, should you be at church? I say to get down to the heart of the matter is, where are you connecting with other Christians where you could be held accountable and you can be there for them as well? Because buildings don't really necessarily live up to that. Katie and I were part of a church that started at a strip mall in Eugene, and next thing we knew, there were about 5,000 people coming on Sunday morning to a uh, high school auditorium, two services. And we were figuring out, as the ministry team, how many people would get in there real quick and get out of there just as fast afterwards. They didn't want any connection. And no matter how much we pleaded, please join a small group. Please come to a Bible study. Please plug in so that we can be there for you as a family. They really just kind of wanted to come and go. And even though we felt like we were succeeding in terms of large numbers of people coming to a building, we felt the ever pressure of failure as so many of them came and went and had no accountability or relationship with other believers. Someone who uses their gifts to serve and generously gives to the mission of the church. And I will also say that these points, if you haven't kind of picked up or kind of a progression of things as you grow in your faith as a Christian. Not only would we like people to plug in and be accountable and be there for others, when someone asks me what church should I go to, I've been going to a bunch of churches, I'm trying to figure out which church is the right one for me, I always say it's the church where you can serve. If you look for the church that's going to serve you, you're already going on the wrong track. It's the church where you hear about a ministry that has the giftings and callings that are in your life, that when you look at it, you say, I could do that. It hasn't been too hard for us to get uh, interns up here. And you guys have known we've been through a lot of interns. It's one of the greatest things we have in our, in our pocket for interns is that we've been able to tell them, you come to our tiny church, we will put you in charge of something. Some of the larger churches will say, you can kind of help out and be in work with someone and say, boy, if you wanted our church, it's yours. Run with it. And there are some that have heard that and said, that's what I want to do. I want to drive an hour out into the middle of the woods and do youth ministry, even though it's going to be harder than doing it here in town. It fits my gifts, my calling. And it's a way that I can give back to the mission of the church. And even the mission of the church has to change sometimes in our definition from the exterior of adding numbers to the core of adding disciples. The church will not grow from more people being in a building. The church will grow if they follow the instructions that Barnabas had for Antioch. Barnabas' encouragement to them in verse 23 of chapter 11 is very, very important for all of us. When he arrived, he saw evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. It's very similar to Jesus' uh, statement about the two greatest commandments. And if we are to follow those as Christians, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul, all our mind, the rest of it all kind of fits in. And then we have the difficult task of loving our neighbor, even our enemy, as ourselves. One of the greatest things I, I see when I look out there and I see all the debates about the virus, um, about closures, about racial tensions, one of the largest things that I see as a root cause for all of it is just human selfishness. 
is that regularly folks are being asked to be care for others more than themselves, be empathetic to those who say they are suffering. And many are saying that's an inconvenience. As Christians, I think one of the greatest things that we can do right now is to practice the golden rule as much as possible. And to say we're doing it, even though we may not agree or may not be on the same page, but say we're doing it because it's what Jesus would have us do, is to care for others more than ourselves. And what's exciting about that is that the more that we begin to look at the world this way, the more free you'll actually see things. As someone who grew up on the mission field, I do not see the world the way many people see the world. I see borders as just nuisances, and sometimes missionaries will sneak through borders just like anyone else because they're tired of having to deal with visas and other things. They see them as man-made structures that are easy to go around. You begin to see everything a little bit differently the more you focus on the mission of God versus the mission of man. And you begin to be able to interact with the different groups saying, I can be for you but not necessarily agree with everything you say. The Apostle Paul phrased it talking about his freedoms and talking about how he would become a slave to the slaves. He'd become a Greek to the Greeks, a Jew to the Jews. To those who are free, he would become free so that all may know and become disciples of Jesus. In the same way, that is our charge as Christians. I think the growth of the church from here on out will have to come down to how quickly we lay down, like the church in Jerusalem, the things that don't matter, and become nimble about the things that do matter. Because we could get hung up on those things, and it just slows us down. In fact, who knows how much bigger the church would be if they had followed the Great Commission wholeheartedly right from the beginning. It took them a long time to get a church started in Antioch. It took Stephen dying before they did it. In the same way, the more that we start to remove the things that have been placed on Christianity that don't matter and focus on the things that do, the faster the gospel will spread. Let us end in prayer. Lord, I want to think back to uh, the time that all the times that I was called a Christian, both positive and negative this week. I want to think back to where you moved during those times. I want to think upon all of the ways that I let down the name Christian as well. All the ways that I disappointed. But Lord, I also would like to repent of the bad and really learn from the ways of the things that worked. And as I move forward as a Christian, I pray that as I carry that name, that people would know that I am a disciple of you, that I walk in your way, and that uh, all the, thing, the negative things that they place on the name is not true, is not from you, but is from the enemy. I pray that we would be good stewards of your faith, good stewards of your grace, and we pray that just like in this account, that we could trust in the fact that these areas where growth are happening, you've already gone ahead of us. You've already started working on the issue that hearts will change quickly if we are just faithful and share what God has done in our lives with those around us. And most of all, Lord, I pray that we would just begin to remove all the exterior stuff that holds us back from the race and slows us down. And that during this time, the church would be so nimble and fast to respond to people to, in love that the name of Christians would be elevated during these dark times, and that the light that's on the hill would shine so brightly for others around us. I pray for everyone um, who during this, their, their faith life has become so much harder. I pray for that, that you would send your Holy Spirit to be with them during the times they reach out to you, as, as the rest of us, so that we would be encouraged to know that you are with us during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How about you stand for our closing song?
I encourage you this week that uh, there's there's a lot we can't do, and I some, sometimes we get trapped into the stuff we can't do and focusing on that. Uh, one of the things I got to do this week was I got to call people. I, I sat down, um, especially in between groups at camp, because I had phone reception and minutes to burn, and I would go through my phone and I'd call call folks, and it was uh, not only I think a blessing to them. Um, it was great to talk to them. I got to talk to Marilyn and Todd and uh, Louise's daughter and a few others, and it was great just kind of talking to them. And I, I made sure I'd kind of set aside a time. It was usually when I had a, a free section of time between groups that was coming by. And I would encourage you that this week, maybe you just call on a few folks and maybe just listen to them vent, maybe. I don't know, whatever helps them. Some of them wanted to talk to me and see how I was doing. Some of them just wanted to talk about what they were going through, but share the love of Christ through a listening ear and an open heart. Let us uh, end in prayer this morning. Lord, I, I thank you for the fact that we can go to you during these difficult times. We can come to your word for inspiration and we can come to you directly through your Holy Spirit. Um, to be touched spiritually, so we, we are just encouraged to know that you are still with us. I pray that we could take that this week and, and, and share it with others, even if it's just through a phone call, um, just to hear how they're doing, to tell them that we were thinking about them, let them know that we, we love them. And I pray that from that, they would maybe even just turn around and talk to you a little bit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful week. Bye.